Uh, hi everyone, thank you for uh, for joining in today. Uh, so I'm Ian Whiffin, I'll be talking about cell phone forensics uh, moving into the future. Uh, and primarily, is it apocalyptical? Is it going to be as bad as you know, some people are predicting that it could be? Uh, first of all, who am I? I'm Ian Whiffin. Uh, for those who don't know me, I started my career back in 2004 in South Yorkshire Police in the UK. Uh, where I worked as a patrol officer for about five years uh, before moving to Canada, continuing to be a response officer uh, with Calgary Police Service, and then joining uh, the digital forensics team, where I spent seven years or so, and then finally moved to Selbright, initially as a subject matter expert, uh, and now as the decoding product manager. Throughout my entire policing career and long before it, I've always considered myself a geek, uh, and back in 2010-ish, I started to write applications that were available in the Apple App Store. Uh, but once I started working in digital forensics, I kind of turned my passion of coding into uh, forensic-related tools instead. Uh, you may recognize some of these. Importantly, though, I've spent the last 12 years as an examiner. I've worked on hundreds of cases, thousands of devices, uh, various different uh, offense types and appeared uh, as an expert witness around 28 times in various countries, some of which you may have seen quite recently on YouTube. Uh, I will say that I'm still an, an examiner at heart, and everything in this presentation is basically based on my personal opinion and experience as an examiner. So the topic again is, what will be the state of cell phone forensics in the next three years? Will things get better than they are right now? Will things stay the same slash get a bit worse? Or will things be downright ugly? We've got a lot of challenges that we've had for a long time and those challenges aren't really letting up. Uh, initially, I'll just do a bit of an overview of some of the challenges that we've had for a while and the challenges that we know uh, still exist and that we expect in the future and obviously access is the biggest of those challenges. Uh, previously, we had uninhibited access to devices, and then we started to see pin locks and passcode locks become way more relevant and prevalent from users. We saw encryption become a thing, and that wiped out a lot of the, uh, the ways that we used to pull data from devices. And then we've also got things like auto wipes after too many uh, bad passcode entries, remote wipes via cloud services various types of biometrics being used, which you know, means that users are more inclined to use security options that are available. USB locks, uh, managed devices, and I include uh, like ghost devices in that too, like phantom devices and things. Inactivity reboot clearly being a, a hot topic recently that's prevented uh, a lot of access. Uh, and geospatial locks too. So devices that even if you have a passcode, you can't create the trust relationship that's required unless the device is in a known location. So lots of access challenges. But even if we get past those access challenges and we can get the data, the next challenge is data overload. Users don't typically own uh, one or two devices anymore. They're gonna have uh, a computer, a laptop, a desktop, their main phone, secondary phones, uh, that could be a, a work phone, a burner phone, or just old phones that they never got rid of. Uh, watches, clouds, probably multiple cloud accounts. If you start thinking about OneDrive, uh, Dropbox, uh, Mega, different services that people are using. Different tablets and vehicles. So lots of different places that we can get data from, and everyone has a unique challenge. But again, assuming that we can even get access to all of those devices, capacity is always going to be a problem. And, and we've seen over the last decade, uh, capacity is increasing exponentially. Uh, and you can also forgive the, uh, uh, the graph not lining up here, but we, we see that on lots of Android devices that still support SD cards, uh, the capacity is, is, is huge. And again, we can't, Forget about the fact uh, that old cell phones still exist. We could be getting a device from two or three years ago and it's still gonna have 64, 128, 256 gig uh, of storage. Two terabyte micro SD cards are already available and four terabyte are due out pretty soon this year. 
It's an amazing amount of storage that can be housed in such a small uh, device. We've got a lot of data that we have to get through. But even assuming that we can get access to this data and we can store all this data and we can work through this data, we now have challenges with how the data is stored, the variety of applications. Uh, you can see almost three and a half million apps uh, across these two main app stores. Uh, the way that the data is stored varies so much. There is a very good chance that the data that you actually want as evidence isn't supported by any vendor application. But then we've got the, a, a new, another challenge. Assuming that we can decode all that data, the user, as I said, has all of these different devices and all of these different sources talk to each other. So it's no longer a matter of saying, you know, this website was visited on this device, this person owns the device, because it, it could be synced from any number of other devices that that person owns, and it may be a different user who's actually using it at the time. So another challenge that we didn't historically have. We can't talk about the future without talking about AI uh, and the challenges that that brings with the ability for any user to create convincing videos, to create convincing misinformation, uh, to employ tools that they wouldn't necessarily have the skill to do without relying on AI to help. End-to-end -end encryption is another kind of ongoing battle. Uh, historically, if we weren't able to get access to a device, there was always the option of going to the service provider and serving a warrant. But now with end-to-end -end encryption being employed by many services as standard, obviously the data that we get, if we get anything from a warrant, could be encrypted and reduces the, uh, the usability of that data. Cloud access. Uh, again, we've seen cloud access uh, increase as devices get harder but more and more services are employing 2FA or MFA, which means that you still need access to the user's device in order to approve access. Uh, and if you have access to the device, how much more do you gain by getting the, uh, the cloud data as well? Potentially, you could definitely get some more data, uh, but personally, I'd always look to the device uh, first. So as I said, these were all things that we've known about for a while, the data access, the data overload, uh, the mesh of, of devices talking to each other and causing confusion, AI being in the mix, uh, warrants becoming problematic if it's encrypted, and 2FA and MFA. Pretty much nothing here is new. What I want to really focus on, though, is that the solutions uh, to these problems can also be in themselves a challenge uh, if they're not handled carefully. What I mean by that specifically uh, is taking shortcuts. Uh, the solutions that have been created to solve the problem of how much data and the variety of data uh, and access to data has created uh, an over-reliance on tools. Uh, examiners who are not necessarily doing a full examination. They're trusting the tool to pass all the data that's important and moving on. And if you're not doing a full examination, then is there enough validation taking place? Uh, tools, as we said, don't get everything on the device. They never will get everything on the device, whether that is an application that's not supported, whether it's deleted data that no longer exists. And you know, there's an inference from that, the fact that data doesn't exist and tools very rarely identify the gaps in the data uh, to show that something's missing. So without doing a full examination, without doing any validation, uh, do you know what's actually been missed from the, uh, from the extraction? Another issue that we see quite a lot is the idea of passing the book. I've already identified uh, how much work there is in the backlog. Uh, the number of devices, the size of devices, it, it's huge. And examiners are ridiculously busy, but so are investigators. Uh, and if all you're doing is essentially passing the book from the examiner to the investigator to do the work, all you've done is, is move the workload to somebody else. You've not really solved a problem. Uh, and we often hear the argument that investigators uh, intimately know the details of the case. And 
I'm never going to argue with that. Investigators will know the details of the case better than the examiner will. But the examiner is the one who has the training, the experience, uh, the understanding of digital forensics. They've got access to multiple tools and they have access to resources that the investigators you know, typically don't have. Uh, and when I talk about resources, I could be talking about uh, the community at large. Like how often do you do analysis on a case, hit an issue that you may not understand, you've not seen before, and you have a community of people that you can reach out to and discuss and bounce ideas off. Uh, and that's not necessarily something the investigator has. And the investigators typically don't know what they don't know. Uh, so if they see something, they may just take it as read without challenging it, without going back to the examiner and asking for clarification. Uh, historically, we've seen combined examiner and investigator roles. So one person who's out doing the, uh, the investigator case and coming back to the office and doing the examination. I think it's fair to say that that kind of uh, hybrid role is dwindling. Agencies are recognizing the importance uh, of having dedicated examiners. Uh, examiners, therefore, must kind of learn to think like an investigator. Uh, they can't just pass the data on and, and hope for the best. They need to, to understand the investigation a little bit more than maybe they previously did. Finally, going back to AI, uh, I, I talk about AI bringing challenges for validation and and putting tools into the hands of people who didn't historically know how to do these things. But AI can also bring solutions. Uh, it may provide useful threads for an examiner to pull on. It, it can work through vast quantities of data very quickly. It can highlight things that may be of interest, uh, but it really is down to the examiner to understand that it is a tool. It's not gonna do your work for you. It's just gonna highlight things that you may want to, to take a deeper look at. It's not going to be able to add context. It's unlikely to do validation of itself properly, and it's not going to be able to add any understanding to the case. That is entirely for the examiner to be able to, uh, to explain and to show. We know that AI hallucinates. We know that it misleads, and we know that it lies. Uh, and again, we don't know what it's actually missing. It could be that it identifies all of these artifacts are interesting. You want to take a look at these. And, and as an examiner, you may focus just on what the AI has surfaced, but you don't necessarily know what the AI missed. Uh, and that could hold the evidence that you actually want. And of course, AI will never testify for you. AI is not going to get on the stand uh, and explain what it did. Uh, and as an examiner, I know I wouldn't feel confident being in court saying that I trusted that the AI did everything that I should have been doing myself. So I've identified these three kind of main uh, challenges that kind of show themselves as solutions. I'm sure there's many more. Uh, these are the ones that I kind of picked on. So the over-reliance on the tool doing its job, passing the book and letting the investigator do the work that the examiner uh, really is in a better position to do uh, and relying too heavily on AI and not using it necessarily as a tool, but using it as a, an additional examiner. Uh, and eventually, these things are going to get challenged in court, right? I don't think it's, it's unfair to say. We've already seen uh, court cases where AI is being challenged, where you know, the examination, the validation is being challenged. And we don't know how long it's going to take for some of these cases to get to court. If I work a case today, it may take months, it may take years until it actually gets heard. And at that point, when it's heard in two years' time, if there's an issue with how I've done the work, with the fact that I relied on AI, the fact that I didn't do my job properly, and I create bad case law, how many other cases that I worked on uh, are going to suffer because of the way that I did the uh, the flow, right? Uh, I just need to make sure that what, what I'm doing, I'm going to be happy with in two years' time, and it's not going to affect the cases that I've worked on in the meantime. Ultimately, we don't know what other challenges are coming. We can predict some. We predicted some that we have now. 
uh, but some were a surprise, and I'm sure there's going to be more surprises coming. But all of these issues, the, the data access, the data overload, the, the mesh network, uh, these are all things that multi-billion dollar companies are putting in place for the benefit of users, and it makes our job harder as a byproduct. We, we don't have any control over these. They're going to slow us down. They may stop uh, what we're doing for a while until we can get to grips with what happened and find a way around it. Uh, but as I said, they're all out of our control. Multi-billion dollar companies uh, doing what's best for the user, making our life difficult in the process. What we can control is our own examinations. Uh, we're the one who decides how much validation, how much work we're going to put into a particular case. We need to ensure that the solutions that are being offered to handle this workload remain as solutions uh, and don't allow them to contribute to the challenges that we're ultimately going to see down the road. The bottom line, really, I think is digital forensics has always been hard. It continues to be hard and it, it will be hard moving into the future. Uh, it's not going to get easier. Again, we're seeing lots of different companies uh, bring lots of different ideas for how to make things harder for us uh, and to make things more secure for users. Uh, but we have a dedicated and a great community, uh, both the, uh, the vendors who are working tirelessly to ensure that we get access as fast as possible, that we support the largest range of applications. We've got a great open source community. Uh, users who are working together to create tools, uh, users who are happy and willing to take time out of their day to help other examiners, uh, regardless of whether you're law enforcement, whether you're uh, private defense work, whatever. I think we've got a great community that, that really wants to help everybody and do the best for digital forensics as a whole. Uh, I see that is the only real thing that will continue into the future that we know. Everything else is a bit of a wild card, and we're, we're going to see how it goes. Uh, if you're interested in any of the tools that, that I have written for Digital Forensics, the, the URL is at the bottom there.